The Watchmaker of Filigree Street is a serviceable, if completely transparent, story. It tells of a typical Victorian-era protagonist caught up in the daily grind of a dull lower-middle-class existence having his life thrown awry by an inciting incident, in this case the bombing of Scotland Yard in 1884. Nathaniel Steepleton, the protagonist with an absurdly artificially British name, is thrust into a quirky world of seemingly alive clockwork contraptions. Dangerous secrets and theoretical physics alongside watchmaker and Japanese immigrant Kita Mori and subversive female protagonist Grace Caro. Oh, but before I explain further, when I say theoretical physics, I'm not talking about, like, in a Terry Pratchett novel. You won't find clever analogies with existing scientific ideas. The, uh, theoretical physics are a resurrection of the commonly known debunked idea of luminiferous ether. The novel takes place in 1884, three years before the famous michelson morley experiment that historically is considered the turning point where the scientific consensus became that this ether was non-existent. And the novel runs the notion that prior experiments which assumed the existence of ether and had huge inconsistencies as a result were just incorrect because of vibrations or whatever. This seems like a weird point to emphasise so early into this review, but I saw somebody on the internet describe this novel as speculative fiction and somebody else describe it as science fiction, and I feel like I have to point out that it is neither scientific nor speculative. The speculation of what would happen if ether were real isn't anything more than the novel's contrived explanation for one of the characters possessing magical powers, and the reason why I'm getting in such a tizzy about this is because I'm some sort of genre policeman or whatever. I mean, I called out Dragon Charm for getting slotted into speculative fiction, so I don't see why this novel should get off the hook. Uh, <clears throat> Moving on. The tone and subjects of this novel are a natural blend of adult sensibilities and childish quirkiness, and it pulls this off much better than the similar attempt made in The Death's Head Chess Club. On the one hand, the novel is set in late 19th century London, tends to remain rooted in realistic stylings, and has adult characters who tend to exhibit pragmatism in their personalities. On the other hand, hidden just behind the veil of that grey, pragmatic world is a wonderment at impossible and seemingly alive clockwork contraptions, a tourist's fascination with Japanese culture, and very simple character arcs and themes that one might expect of a light and unchallenging young adult fiction. The writing is so whimsical and playful that it falls flat on regular occasions. In fact, a friend of mine pointed out to me that they were hit with an exceptionally awkward sentence on the very first page. Nathaniel had heard more than once that its failure to expand was a sign of the Home Secretary's continuing mistrust of naval inventions. But even if that wasn't the case, the departmental budget had never stretched to the replacement of the original carpet, which liked to keep the ghosts of old smells. You see how this is a run-on sentence, which is mostly fluff. Nitpicking for a bit here, there are a lot of extraneous clusters of words in this sentence that bog it down for the sake of style. It's possible to take more than once that out of the sentence and retain the same meaning. The middle clause, but even if that wasn't the case, can simply be replaced with the word however, which would also allow us to eliminate a comma, and the replacement of could probably just say replace. These are three ways in which this sentence can be made more elegant without changing the meaning or sacrificing the style. Nathaniel had heard its failure to expand was a sign of the Home Secretary's continuing mistrust of naval inventions. However, the departmental budget had never stretched to replace the original carpet, which liked to keep the ghosts of old smells. And this is not an isolated example of the awkward writing style. Playful poetry that trips over its own bells and whistles is sorely commonplace in Watchmaker. It does lend itself to some very good and funny lines at certain points, however whatever positives there are to the writing style more often than not get undermined by the lack of thought put into what the writing is trying to convey, exemplified by lines such as this one. Although one could still do proper science with a magnet and some iron filings, it felt professional to have made something that looked like a mutated windmill. Science had to have some mystery, otherwise everyone would find out how simple it was. Now, there's nothing wrong with how this sentence is written, and I actually like how the writing here kind of reflects the self-gratifying pomp of the character whose perspective is dominating the narration at this point. My problem is not that it's written in a fluffy yet easily readable way, but more that the underlying idea and attitude is so naive and simple and downright wrong. 
Scientists, more often than not, are frustrated with the fact that they can't simplify scientific information down enough for it to be comprehensible to the general public. The struggle of science communication is trying to present science to a layman audience in an uncomplicated way that they can be reasonably expected to understand without simplifying too much to lose the truth with the complexities. However, this line seems to be carrying the notion that scientists are all pseudo-intellectual elitists who deliberately complicate scientific language with jargon. I mean, sure, at the end of the day it's a throwaway sentence, and it's probably probably not going to piss off anyone but me because I teach high school level science. But I think it's emblematic of a larger problem in that this novel is entertaining to read, however there's a lack of thought put into the ideas that the novel illustrates and the finer details of its writing. I won't lie, I like this novel's style, and I think this novel might perfectly cater to the quite large audience of adults who frequently enjoy young adult and children's entertainment because of its lightheartedness, ease of engagement, and high prioritization of entertainment. Which is not the same thing as saying that The Watchmaker Filigree Street is written for young adults or children. Children. But I think it's needless to say that this is a novel that should be read with the brain turned off. There is substance to be found in the focus on Japanese themes and immigration, but I'm inclined to believe that even this element is reasonably surface level as far as Japanese themes go. Watchmaker of Fligree Street is unfortunately rooted into very conventional narrative structure. In itself not entirely a very substantial criticism, however, the writing can consequently exhibit an extremely noticeable transparency at times. The first thing that readers of young adult fantasy adventure fiction may pick up on is that the novel feels as though it's going out of its way to have both a male and female protagonist pair. One, an everyman. The other, a subversive, independent woman who defies gender norms, who are thrust into a quirky world of mischievous, wondrous, and dangerous things just to be on the veil of our own mundane world, by way of a third character who acts as the metaphorical gatekeeper between them. In this case, no, we're not actually exploring a new world, but those archetypes are where it feels as though the characters are being picked from nonetheless. And it feels less as though the characters are behaving in this way because it makes sense for them to do so in the narrative, and more so that the narrative is contriving itself around some unspoken rule that the characters have to behave in this way. One scene which stood out to me as an egregious shattering of my suspension of disbelief was the scene where the male and female lead meet for the first time, because of the contrivances required for this scene to fulfil its narrative goal as well as the unrealistic brevity of the scene itself. The scene takes place at an overnight ball, which makes it very odd that the scene is so short. After a major side character from Grace's storyline scores an unlikely win on the roulette table, Grace is so surprised that, in her excitement, she steps back and bumps into Nathan. They exchange apologies, but then for no reason in particular, Grace begins to make wholly unromantic observations about his appearance and decides, again for no reason in particular, that she wants to hang out with him for the rest of the ball. They dance for a while, and after she says that she should get back to her friend, Nathan offers her, again for no reason in particular, to go listen to some music, and then that leads her to invite him out the next day, for no reason in particular, which acts as the lead into finally intertwining their stories around Kita Mori. Reading this scene felt as though I could just barely make out the author's notes behind the text. Ball scene, Grace enters, Grace bumps into Nathan, Grace and Nathan do things together at a ball to establish friendship, Grace invites Nathan out the next day, Nathan goes to see Grace the next day and tells her about Kita, transition into next act of the story. This novel has a few scenes like this, where it seems as though the narrative structure is becoming eerily visible behind the words on the page. This is understandable if only because this is Pulley's first novel, but as it stands I think it's safe to say that the watchmaker of Filigree Street is style over substance. Between the clockwork, the bombing conspiracies, the theoretical physics, the political tension between public officers and the Japanese tourism, the novel lacks a real central focus, and the broad range of elements end up feeling shallow when determined individually. The style is good, it's fine, it's ultimately entertaining. There's a quirky little clockwork octopus, little funny clockwork birds, some rowdy kid characters, some eccentric but humble Japanese men, some intrigue between public officers, nobility and the police, and the writing style dips and ebbs with flotsam and jetsam to deliver some memorable lines and such. But Underneath all that is a simple, conventional story with simple, conventional characters and some simple, conventional themes that are artificial and predictable like, well, like clockwork. <laughs> If you find the idea of Victorian era science fantasy with clockwork an enticing premise on its own, then the story underneath doesn't commit too many sins that you will likely be satisfied despite its shortcomings. So I'll give this one a soft recommendation for the style, as well as the inclusion of Japanese culture and themes for anyone with a surface level interest in the subject. Also, if you know of novels that use a fantasy clockwork style or include Japanese themes written for English speaking audiences, feel free to recommend them in the comments below. Don't forget to check out the artist who did the background for this video, as well as the musician who produced the background music. Links to their content are in the description. Thanks for watching.